You know, analog tape, analog tape has been on my mind lately. I can't really explain why or how, it just is, it just is. And it, the, the, today's episode is mostly gonna be my, my journey, my journey with analog tape, <clears throat> which really begins in the late 60s when I bought my first reel-to-reel -reel machine, which was a Tanberg. And I bought it specifically with the intention, here was my idea, I was gonna buy it so that every time I bought a new record, a new LP, I would record it the very first time I played it, so it would remain perfect. And I'd never play the record again, I would just play the tape, right. And my friends, I would also corral my friends into this idea, hey, when you buy a record, when I'm with you, let's go over to my place and I'll play your record the first time and then I'll have this tape and maybe I'll make a tape for you or whatever. And this way our records would never wear out. That's how, <laughs> I was gonna say, that's how dumb I was. But anyway, that was the theory, that was the plan. Didn't really work out that way, because you know what? Yeah, I did, I played the tapes a couple of times, but you know, I really, you know, I just wanna play the record, <laughs> even then. The reality set in that I bought records to play records. The idea of keeping them perfect wasn't really the idea. I wanted to play the music and the, the experience of playing records was more important than keeping them perfect and in fact as i mentioned many times in these videos i have records that i bought 50 years ago that still sound pretty darn good so i didn't really need to keep them perfect but i didn't know that then <laughs> you know and he also had this idea that i would record uh radio shows uh because i, I just love certain disc jockeys and i could play those those episodes, those shows again, or I play them in the future. I had those ideas, or I'd have my girlfriend record them when I was at home and I could hear the ones that I missed. That's sort of the rationale for owning a reel-to-reel -reel machine. Since I wasn't a musician and I wasn't recording my own music, I didn't have any friends who were musicians at the time, so I wasn't gonna record their music. So yeah, I was gonna record uh, my records or my friend's records, or I was gonna record uh, radio. That was it. In fact, none of those things in the long term ever really, pardon the expression, played out. So here's, here's my overarching question for today's episode. It didn't work out for me, the idea that the tape would be a way of preserving certain things into the future. It didn't work out for me, but maybe it worked out for you in a small way or in a bigger way. And I wanna hear from you guys and whatever tape format it was, cassette, real to real, whatever. How did that work out for you? And if you are or were a musician, did you record yourself? Did you use it to record your music or your band's music or your kid's music or your spouse's music? Was it useful in that way? Because I'm sure it, it, it is or was for a lot of people. Just because it wasn't for me, that doesn't mean anything, right? So I want to hear from you people about that. But I get the feeling for many, many audiophiles, they had similar paths to me. They bought it to record their music in whatever form it was. In any case, uh, that's, that's kind of where I was coming from. So I had that first um, Tanberg for, for quite a while, two, three years. And then I, I bought a TIAC reel-to-reel. And the TIAC, for whatever reason, did not stick around that long. And then I think I didn't have a reel-to-reel -reel machine for a while. Oh, by the way, when I had the Tanberg, I recorded the closing night of the Fillmore. And I stayed up all night recording it because it was many hours, five or six hours or something, maybe longer. So as many reels of tape, which were very expensive, and I'll get to that. You know, I'll cover that in greater detail over this episode. But anyway, I recorded it. Oh man, it was like all these bands. And you know what? I don't think I ever really played those tapes. And now looking back, you know, a half century later, I wish I had those tapes. I'd have no idea what, what became of those tapes. Oh, I have to interrupt myself. Yes, there will be an audiophiliac viewer system of the day at the conclusion of today's episode. Now, yes, I did buy, uh, that. not that many years later, I did buy a Sony Walkman Pro, a WMD6C. I think that was the model number. 
and I use that to record concerts either of my friends or somewhat secretly at like the Rolling Stones at Madison Square Garden and stuff and that was a whole thing to record secretly it was not a lot of fun and took away a lot of the <laughs> enjoyment of being at a concert if you're recording it secretly but I'll tell you one thing I learned about recording uh, concerts and that is whatever my experience was at the concert like this is a really great show or this is a eh, kind of a blah show that when I pl played back the recording the next day uh, my playing it back wasn't it, the experience the original experience and what I was feeling the next day almost never lined up if it was a great show the night before the next day it was like eh, I don't think I really captured the greatness of it or if it was a blah performance the night before I, th I a lot of times I thought oh, it's, it's, it's actually pretty good so capturing whatever was going down at the performance and having that in the recording was kind of hit or miss really it just was it's, you know it's the magic of recording and I was not in any way shape or form a professional recording engineer and I was recording again obviously from the audience perspective and you know I just want to throw out this other angle of the whole cassette thing is cassettes themselves blank cassettes were very expensive in the context of the time you know a cassette a blank um, TDK SA90 tape was about four well maybe five dollars in 1980 which would translate into about I don't know, 16 17 dollars today so as her Reichert says they're not free you know they were not free and, I, and when I think about it in terms of um, to change the subject slightly to um, to v video recording when I had you know a VHS recorder at home and I would record TV shows that I was gonna miss or something and people would line up around the block to buy VHS tapes blank VHS tapes and blank beta tapes and they would buy 10 packs of them and, they, and the, those 10 packs would be forty dollars or something it would be like huge amounts of money at the time and they would buy massive amounts of them it was really really a lot of money and I just and I and I barely watched those recordings I the ones that I used the, the VHS tapes that I recorded of TV shows that I missed sometimes I watched them a lot of times I didn't and the ones that I thought oh I'm gonna save these because I'm gonna watch them you know in the future you know next year two years from now when I'm bored I almost never did so I'm, I'm wondering if you're old enough to have been through that and recorded to beta or VHS and were recording for the future did you ever watch those things or watch them with any regularity was it worth it in other words to have a wall of tapes that you recorded or even movies that you bought did you watch them on a regular basis speaking for myself almost never <laughs> almost never but recordings that I've made uh, to audio tape or to video no and I don't understand why what's the difference you know why not I can't explain it I just know that it's true oh man how can I neglect mixtapes so you know I started making mixtapes before that word was coined I was making intermission music tapes on reel to reel for movie theaters the movie theaters I worked in as a movie theater projectionist here in New York City matter of fact I bought a reel to reel tape machine for the movie theater because they didn't, obviously they didn't have a machine I bought it in a pawn shop this reel to reel machine a really funky machine but actually it worked pretty darn well and I had my Tanberg still so I had the Tanberg machine at home and I would program music to sort of match the movie that I was showing so if it was a scary movie I would find scary music etc etc and it was fun to do now of course that and later on when I was doing actual mixtapes I was doing them initially from from LPs and I would you know cue up the tape and I would drop the needle and hit record and if it, if it all went well it was it was fun and if it was if I made a mistake in terms of the timing of hitting record and dropping the record I'd have to start again and when you make a mistake and there was too long a pause before the music started you have to stop restart what a pain in the butt 
it was so much easier to do it from CDs, you know, starting in the 80s. But when you were doing it from vinyl, from singles or LPs, to make a 90-minute tape could take you four or five hours, even if you had, even if you kind of knew where you were going in terms of the music selection. But, you know, it was kind of the fun. It was kind of exhilarating because when you were done, when you finished making a mixtape, and you were really proud of the choices and the segues of the music. It was really, really good, you know. So I made mixtapes for movie theaters, and I made them for my friends. I made them for my wife. Usually it was the idea that I was going to turn them on to new music, because I was always looking for new music. It was kind of the way my, my brain works. And they would say, Steve, what's happening? What should, what, what should I be listening to? And I would make them a mixtape and say, here, check this out. And you know, a lot of them were misses, but sometimes they say, wow, oh, I love, yeah, and I'd be, it would make me happy to turn people on to new, to new music, and I still feel that way, and that's why I drop in these music selections in these reviews that I'm doing for you on YouTube, because occasionally <laughs> you guys connect, and you're, that's, that's very uh, satisfying for me. But anyway, in an earlier time, it was through mixtapes, so Yes, I'd love to hear your stories of mixtape creation. Share them in the comments, please. Oh, I need to include, I ha just out of, uh, well, I'm not sure why, but I will include these two tape formats. Uh, DCC, this is a hybrid digital analog cassette format, came and went in a flash. No one cared. No one. Absolutely no one cared. And... This one here, this is the DAT format. Now this stuck around for quite a while as a pro format and had some crossover appeal for audiophiles. Not much, not much at all. But as a pro format, yeah. Actually, uh, Chesky Records recorded the first, I don't know, four or five or six albums to DAT. They also recorded those same albums to analog reel-to-reel -reel tape. And, uh, yeah, those are my thoughts on analog tape. Well, on tape. And, uh, you know, like I said, I want to hear from you guys about what, what, what was the tape journey like for you? Uh, where did it go? Did it actually go anywhere? And if you're a younger audiophile, were you uh, tape curious? Did you get into it after it was all over? Like, well, kind of like now, where supposedly analog cassette tapes have made some sort of a comeback. Anyway, it is now time for <laughs> the Audiophiliac Viewer System of the Day. This one comes from Raphael. The subject line of his email was Madness in Dub. The speakers, the drivers, are louder DX65s mounted in Kane and Kane Aileron cabinets. There's also an Alltech 890C Valencia. Well, for electronics, we see a Phi X amplifier with MagnaQuest iron. Also, a Sonic Oil Corniff 45 amp an emotive audio Arato preamp, and also Right Sound AG Phono preamp. Digital is handled by a Chord Hugo driven by a Mac Mini. Analog, well, there's a Garrard 301 with a Jelco 750 arm with a Denon 103 cartridge hooked up to Altec 4711 step-up transformers. Raphael says it sounds awesome. And you know what? I bet it does. Hey, that was pretty cool. And speaking of cool, my name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel. To do so is super easy. All you have to do is hit that button right down there. That's all you got to do. The rest, nothing to it, right? And beyond that, you might you might want to check out the Patreon, which can be found at p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash audiophiliac. And that's it. My work here is at last complete. So thank you again for watching, and I really, really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon.
Bye-bye.